I'm Chris Farrell, and this is On Watch. Welcome to On Watch, everybody, the Judicial Watch podcast, where we take a deep dive behind the headlines to cover news items that the mainstream media probably doesn't want you to know about, where we try to recover some lost history, where we try to explain the inexplicable. And we really, we really appreciate you taking the time to join us across either our video platform, uh, whether you're watching us on YouTube or Rumble, or on any of the audio platforms out there, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, et cetera. We appreciate you taking the time to join us. And we know that we reach out to nearly 23 million people across all these different platforms uh, and the folks that subscribe to us via email or other forms, formats. So uh, thank you. We really appreciate the, your interest and your efforts and uh, please share the show with your friends and family. Today we have an incredible treat for you. Uh, a really inc a, a wonderful book by an amazing woman. And so uh, Dr. Naomi Wolf, a New York Times bestselling author, a Democratic consultant in days gone by, a journalist, and currently the CEO of DailyClout.io is joining us. Welcome to On Watch, Dr. Naomi Wolf. Thank you so much for having me. As I told you earlier, I'm a giant fan of Judicial Watch and have loved your organization for many years. Thank you so much, we really appreciate it. Um, we have you on today because you've got a fantastic new book called Facing the Beast. I recommend everybody, in fact, it just comes out, I guess it officially comes out tomorrow, the 9th. So I recommend that all of our viewers and listeners go out and get a copy, uh, whether you order it online or go to a bookstore. Facing the Beast is a tremendous book. I've read every word of it and I highly recommend it to you. Um, Naomi, you've got a tremendous background and, and to put it in sort of like junior high terms, um, in junior high, we would say that you used to be one of the cool kids, <laughs> right? You, you, were, you were part of the bi-coastal elite. You were going to all the right parties and events, and you were connected to all the super influential, powerful people. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you had the temerity. You asked unpleasant questions, and you said things that people didn't necessarily like, and they got all bent out of shape. And that's really, at least in my, my explanation, that's really what you cover in your book is the world pre-COVID and then the world in COVID and now sort of we're on the other side of that, but it's quite a journey you've been through. Uh, that's my explanation. So, uh, you know, from, a, from somebody who was on the inside as one of the cool kids, you've gone through quite a journey. Tell us a little bit about it, please. Sure, and uh, that's that's a great summary. Um, yeah, so for 35 years since I was in my 20s, um, I have been privileged uh, and, and cursed, I didn't realize till recently, to be kind of a fixture in the legacy media bubble, um, the and then the political bubble in New York and in Washington DC and kind of that bi-coastal bubble and on the left. Um, and so I thought I understood the world and I was again privileged and I go into this little bit in Facing the Beast to be you know, at the galas, at the screenings, at the dinner parties um, with all of these kind of global influencers for a long time. Uh, and so I believed in those institutions. I thought the people around me were thoughtful, credible people who engaged in critical thinking. I thought journalism was there to find the truth. I mean, I knew there were flaws. I thought medicine was there to heal people um but i i literally did not know that i was sitting on a, a mountain of corruption and then on one day in june of 2021 i did what i've literally been doing for decades which is i posted an accurate tweet uh in this case about women reporting eyewitness accounts of their own bodies right um that they were having menstrual problems upon receiving these mrna injections for COVID. Right. And like literally, I've been lionized for books about, um, you know, women's sexual and reproductive health and fertility. And uh, it's not a new beat for me. I've been 
caring about women's health for decades. And this was a legitimate, like when a lot of women say something's wrong, especially about something embarrassing, to me as a journalist, that's that merits more investigation because women don't like bringing up embarrassing personal subjects. Um, and also in, in the history of medicine, there are many, many, many cases of women being ignored and their symptoms being ignored until there's a really looming problem like silicone breast implants or thalidomide and so on. I was going to say, and, and, ex and experimented on, frankly. There's women totally. who have been experimented on and uh, even the, the term hysteria, right, is the, the root goes back to a, well, you can tie it back to hysterectomies, but the idea being that uh, women are subject to these things and they're, they're obviously very, like you said, very embarrassing or very personal medical uh, details. You're supposed to believe it, but then don't believe it. And then right. if, it doesn't, if it doesn't run with the official narrative, well, then somehow you're being ridiculous. It's, yeah. it's a very, it's a schizophrenic but, reaction. Well, it's totally, I mean, <laughs> I feel like you must have taken you know, feminist medical history 101, because that's exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> that, um, it, the word hysterical comes from hyster, which is Greek for uterus. And people, you know, Galen used to believe, the Greeks used to believe that women's women were crazy because their uteruses traveled around their bodies, right? So um, that's descended to us in kind of patriarchal medical practice by every woman watching this knows that there are times that women will say to their OBGYN or to their, you know, primary care doctor, I'm having these symptoms and they'll be told it's all in their head or poo pooed or told they're crazy and so on. Right. It's nothing new. We all knew that. But in this case, I was immediately deplatformed and I wasn't just deplatformed, but I experienced this global reputational attack. Uh, my Wikipedia changed immediately, you know, every bio around the world, which used to be Rhodes Scholar, advisor to a vice president, um, you know, nine bestsellers, you know, most important leader under 40, glamour woman of the year. It it all changed to conspiracy theorists like overnight. And at that time, and, I just, and, and, that, and that is literally true. So in yeah. the sense that if somebody goes out and they Google you or they wiki you, it comes up. And it, the second or third entry says conspiracy theorists, which exactly. is which is insanely defamatory. But so that's defamatory. a that's a se separate issue. But yeah, I mean we're suing, but <laughs> but yes, it's well, it's it's very damaging, right? Especially to a nonfiction writer who has built a whole career on saying things that are true and verifiable. So uh, that happened, and immediately. I didn't just get ousted from my uh, reputation, but I got ousted from my world. And overnight, especially because I continued to question lockdowns and masking and um, the closing of Main Street, and 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 I recognized early on from my work on totalitarianism that we were in an advanced takeover, an ad advanced coup against democratic freedoms. Um, Overnight, I was, you know, kicked off of the lists and, uh, you know, not editors wouldn't return my calls. People who'd been publishing my work for decades, places where I'd been a columnist, um, you know, would treat me like a non-person or ran defamatory articles. So I don't mean to be uh, whining about my personal fate, but I'm setting the stage to say that this was a blessing in disguise because the left kicked me out and closed the door. But the people who kept talking to me or who wanted to talk to me, well, number one, Steve Bannon, whom I'd been told was the devil incarnate. And also, to my surprise, uh, conservatives wanted to talk to me. If women were in danger and babies were in danger, they wanted to know. People of faith wanted to talk to me, pastors, ministers, Orthodox rabbis, and libertarians wanted to talk to me because they agreed that freedom was important. So my life kind of turned upside down. And for the next, well, till the present, I had nonstop conversations with these other people that had been represented to me as really hateful or, you know, racist or misogynist or- Primitive in some way, yeah. Yeah, and, I, and, and those conversations led me to completely re-examine many things I believed. And I go into this in Facing the Beast. It, it They led me to a, a, a letter I wrote called Dear Conservatives, I Apologize, it, which is kind of the climax of the book in which I 
enumerate the nonsensical things I believed that I later realized were not true. Everything from the narrative of uh, January 6th to the Steele dossier to, um, you know, Russian interference in the elections to Hunter Biden's laptop. Everything I believed about those stories and more were not true. My reexamination of the Second Amendment, which I now embrace, um, over and over, I had to look at things I believed as a liberal, as a left-wing liberal, and realize a lot of it was nonsense. Um, and the other tragic thing, which I narrate in this book, is how people whom I believed were tolerant, cared about equality, critical thinkers overnight embraced a discrimination society based on medical status, even though they would never discriminate against gay and lesbian people or people of color. Uh, that was a shock. And also these same critically thinking people became delusional and unable to reason and would say things like, don't show me primary source documentation, for instance, about these injections. Right. Um, and then I'll skip ahead. The journey also kind of led me to uh, become much more um, believing in a literal God <laughs> because the, the the scale of evil I saw was so beyond what human beings could accomplish alone. Yeah. I concluded that it was a metaphysical battle playing right. out in politics and that um, that this was a spiritual warfare between good and evil. That is literally the next point on my little note in front of me is that you are involved or you trace out, you do sort of a story arc of two things. One is a spiritual battle, and you, you're very brave because you actually relate your own personal journey in this. It would be very easy to stand off at the 100,000 foot level and talk about policy or talk about sort of patterns or, or medical reports, but you talk personally about your own sort of spiritual growth, the shift, the change, uh, things that you reconsidered that you thought you had decided before. So there's a spiritual component to the story that I found very compelling, very interesting. And there's also, you, probably at a higher level, you talk about we're really in a civilizational crisis. This is not just an argument over some public policy issue. Right? This is something that affects the fabric not just of our country. I mean, there's a global issue here, but in particular for, the, for an American audience, th this affects the fabric of our country. From the community level, you talk about your own experiences in your hometown, to you know what the situation's like in New York versus going down to Florida, and the impact it has. It, it, it shifted things in a way that you just don't snap your fingers and move it back. Right. And so those, those two pieces, I mean, I kind of open the door anywhere you want to go on that, but the spiritual uh, kind of battle and then really the civilizational crisis that we're in. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's so satisfying to me to, this is one of the first conversations I've had with someone who's read the book and has it physically in his hands. And it's very exciting. I mean, everything you've said is, is true, is very central to the journey I took. And it seemed important to tell this story from a, a personal perspective because well a i have nothing left to lose right? <laughs> <laughs> like people tend to you know in the past for instance i i was always i always kind of believed in and was curious about god uh but in my former world that was so shameful yeah you that's know, not cool you're not you lose not, you talk about cool your faith that's you lose cool points right off the bat totally and I remember when I first started hanging out with conservatives, sometimes they'd say, you know, can we say grace or can I pray for you? Like when I was injured, conservative friends were praying for me and uh, I loved it. But <laughs> but in my old, in my previous <laughs> world, when I heard people praying, you know, I was drawn to it, but I was also like, oh, that, that's, I'm not really allowed to do that. That's kind of weird. <laughs> like, right, there's right. So much censoriousness. And I wrote about this, like, I, you have to do this in the first person, right? Because I didn't realize till I was living in what I called the rest of America, where I realized there's so many fun things and wonderful things that people in the rest of America <laughs> get to do, right? That that in my tight little neurotic liberal <laughs> world, we were not allowed to even consider. And they're right. ridiculous things like 
you know, you can't play pool and drink whiskey in your garage. You, know? <laughs> you just can't, you know, you, you can't like country music. You can't like recliners. You know, I remember when I sat in a lazy boy for the first time, I was like, this is awesome. You know, you can't do it. You can't go hunting. You know, you can't like, there's so many can'ts, right? You're not allowed. You're not allowed to shoot a gun for sure. And I, you sure. know, my husband's teaching me to shoot and I love it, but I didn't really realize until I was broken out of that world that, how can I put this, that people in the rest of America, and forgive me, I don't really have good language that's not annoying to describe these two worlds, but they are two worlds, right? Yep, they are. They're, they're living lives full of meaning and joy <laughs> that people inside the global liter liberal elite can't even imagine. Um, and that that has an impact on us as a, as a country, like the division, but also the fact that in order to succeed and maintain your position in the insider world of liberal cool kids running like the media, you have to be censorious and secular and judgmental and status obsessed and humorless and a, a lot of other stupid things. Um, that's a bit of a detour. So I'm sorry, what was your question? No, um, no, you, you are right on okay, the nose. Right. I mean, that's... Uh... What you're talking about is uh, it, it takes me to the next question because you hit the nail uh, hit the nail right on the head with that. But there's an interesting discussion you have on the the tension or sort of the, uh, the I guess they're side by side. This this notion of conforming and then coercion, right? Mm -hmm. That you're right. that as as the COVID pandemic kicks off and everyone becomes increasingly hysterical over wearing your mask or not wearing a mask. And, you know, uh, I'm one of those people that is not inoculated. Oh my goodness, I don't have a vaccine. So obviously I'm unclean. I should ring a bell in front of me as I walk along. Uh, but th there's tremendous effort at either confirmation, going along with it, and the coercive power that was exerted on people at a level never before experienced in the United States. Yeah. Well, and you're you're taking me back to what I really wanted to stress, which is I nothing could have prepared me for how eagerly half the country embraced personal authoritarianism and submission. It wasn't just that they wanted to dominate others. And I go into this, the glee with which certain people would say, cover your nose, cover your nose, or yep. You know, yell at me when I tried to enter a, a movie theater in my idyllic little small town in upstate New York. I, I too am unvaccinated. Um, but also the submission, you know, that so many people wanted, like, I have friends in New York, or I guess former friendship circles, where everyone would like take a test and compare their test results before <laughs> every party, before every I have gathering. to laugh, I'm sorry, but comparing test results is, I mean, that is insanity. But I, I know what you're saying, I get it, I get it. But, but it became, I mean, I think this relates to what we were saying earlier about how rigidly secular that world is, because I do think all of those weird rituals and, and submission and sense that through submitting to these rituals, you're engaging in something bigger than yourself, I think it filled uh, you know, that God-shaped void in people. Yep, yep. And, and that's why they're so reluctant to let it go or why some people are so reluctant to let it go and reluctant to examine evidence, even the most sober scientific evidence, like the work of my 3,250 doctors and scientists working on the Pfizer documents. Um, they, they are so attached to that sense of meaning that those rituals gave them that um, they don't want, they, they've traded critical thinking, they've even traded their children's well-being for the chance to be part of that Borg. And what's so scary is that, you know, this is not in the rear view mirror because we now have a an AI generated kind of mind control machine essentially that just changes channels, right? People have shown that they're willing to like, give up critical thinking, give up dissent, look at what happened to people like me or, you know, other people who were ostracized, the Great Barrington Declaration signatories, right. um, people who lost everything, doctors who are losing their medical licenses. And 
and and this the, the evildoers know they can just switch the channel to Ukraine. Well, that's not working so well. Switch the channel to climate change. Switch that that's not that persuasive. Switch the channel to Israel Palestine and just inflame and distract and get us to lose more of our freedoms and more of our freedoms and and people have to wake up from that um from feeding their brains into that machine we're 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 in the middle of one great big enormous milgram experiment T tell our tell our our viewers and our listeners what that is i don't think everybody knows what uh, milgram experiments are and how they were conducted and Tell us a little bit about that. You use that in your book as a great way to explain the insanity. Yeah, well, if I'm remembering correctly, um, and that Milgram is not Zimbardo, uh, so please correct me if I'm describing this wrong. M Milgr Stanley Milgram was a Yale psychologist in the early 60s who did an experiment in which an authority instructed his students or the people who volunteered for this experiment to inflict pain on subjects. And they were willing to inflict higher and higher levels of pain as long as the authority figure, I believe in a white coat, told them to do so. Right. So it's really an experiment in, well, in authoritarianism and how quickly uh, people are willing to throw away their morals um, and their and, and just silence their own internal conscience in order to conform to the directives of someone they see as an authority figure. And some, up, some up, up to the point, up to the point of death. I think that exactly. they, they, they were told, well, listen, you know, uh, this person deserves this and they really, uh, it's for, in their best interest. So just go ahead and throw the switch and people would go, okay, and they do it. And that is, that's one of the creepiest examples that, uh, I mean, I, the, the, I guess the most humorous version of that would have been in Ghostbusters, and initially they're doing the ESP testing, and uh, Bill Murray is shocking a guy across the table, but this is the severe version of it, not the joke in Ghostbusters, but uh, instead an experiment where people were willing to inflict electrical shock pain on other people because the authority told them it was okay, and they were more than willing to comply and carry it out. Uh, unthinkingly, just obedience. And that's okay. what we see. I, I can remember, I'll tell you my own little brief snippet. I was in a Wegmans supermarket in Northern Virginia at Christmas time, and the place was jammed. Everyone's running around shopping like mad. And there was a guy who you could, uh, you got the vibe off him that he was sort of a political operative right off the bat. He was, he was very emphatic in all that he was doing. And uh, he started screaming at a mom and her I don't know, 12, 14 year old daughter, because in Virginia, you didn't have to mask. It mm -hmm. was suggested, it was recommended, but there wasn't this full on totalitarianism. And he's screaming, and of course he picked a weak subject, right? Here's a mom with her daughter, and he's screaming at her in the middle of the supermarket. So I, in my own inimitable style, I intervened and uh, told him what he could do and where he could go, and it stopped. But, but there were people, would came up to me afterwards and said, thank you. Because they were afraid themselves to tell the guy, move along, shut up, mind your own business. Uh, and they, they were happy, well, they were glad that somebody defended a mom and a daughter uh, from this screaming maniac in the middle of a supermarket. I mean, you, you give examples like this in restaurants in New York, things you experienced. You talk about the movie theater in your hometown, about friends who said, well, maybe later I can, I can visit with you or something if we're outside. This is how people are turned against each other. And it was the entire country, and with very few exceptions. Yeah, yeah, and it's so interesting that the, I think two thirds of the subjects in the, Zimbar in the uh, Milgram experiments submitted to some level of uh, enacting sadism on their fellow purported human beings. And yeah. one third just didn't and like would get up and walk out. Weirdly to me, the statistics are about the same for people who, you know, kind of drank all the Kool-Aid, complied with everything. It's about 60-30. Same thing with vaccination rates. I mean, CDC probably overstates vaccination rates, but right. it's, it, you know, the country's very divided. And that brings me also to this question of kind of divine providence because 
for, for two and a half years, or I would say two years, I was bringing the evidence of um, the injuries and deaths and disabilities that my team of researchers found in the Pfizer documents released under court order to whoever would talk to me. <clears throat> and as I mentioned to you earlier, it was really conservatives and libertarians who would talk to me. Right. But what the effect of that was, you know, like we're the last independent media outlets like this one and Daily Cloud and, you know, Steve Bannon's show. The effect of that was that weirdly, half the country was hearing about these dangers and able to protect themselves and their families better. And half the country just wasn't. Um, and it, it reminds me so much of like that section Exodus where the angel of death is is like putting an X over the houses of the children right. of Israel and yep. sparing the firstborn. I'm not sure why I'm sharing that, but I guess we saw that the country's so divided and it's really divided now into people who are thinking critically and are able to get pretty good information from alternative media versus people who submitted to authority in a very Milgram-like way and believe nonsense, but they believe nonsense that can injure them or kill them. Yep, I agree with you 100%. And, and even when people explored, I'll give you a great example. My good friend and colleague of 25 years, Tom Fitton, posted on Twitter, uh, hydroxychloroquine is a safe drug, period. It was about the 20th time he had just put that single declarative sentence up on Twitter. And they banned him. I think he was off of Twitter for eight months. It's, a, it's an objectively true thing. Hydroxychloroquine is a safe drug, and it's been used for decades. But they banned him because they, they said, unless you retract it, you can't come back, and all the usual nonsense. I know you've been through it on multiple uh, platforms and occasions. But, um, you know, there are instances where uh, ivermectin, another drug that, uh, you know, a number of medical authorities say it had a legitimate use and was a possible treatment, you know, with respect to COVID. And then there are people, who, you know, oh, you're going to shoot yourself up with a horse wormer. I mean, reckless, crazy language about stuff, almost seemingly almost deliberately false and misleading right. that they were they were so over the top in their mischaracterization uh, that it was there was vendetta attached to it. It wasn't just, I don't agree with you. It's, I don't agree with you, and by the way, I'm gonna either humiliate you or destroy you. And that's where the shift occurred that is so important that you talk about in the book. Yeah, yeah. And part of this war on dissent is a war, again, on our minds, because, uh, you know, everyone from the KGB to, you know, Mao's, enforcers know that the goal is to get us to a point where we can't tell truth from lies. And so I think that's why some of the lying was so egregious. Um, there's no longer a need for people in the White House to demonstrate that they're telling the truth. Um, and in, in, in your book, you say that we are now in a post-truth world. What does that mean? What, do we, what does it mean to live in a post-truth world? Well, I just wrote a, a subdeck essay about this. It's, there are mannerisms and, and words being introduced into our language that, I mean, I, I really think a lot of this is psychological conditioning that are, are trying to wear down our habits of mind as free people. And, um, you know, as I've said many times, people have a, a mistaken view of what a totalitarian society looks like. It can look just like now with like Walmart and, you know, football games. But if elections can't be counted accurately, if the judiciary is going to, you know, haul a presidential candidate into prison willy nilly, if um, if the media it never has to retract or correct something that is a lie, it, it's really not a democracy anymore. It's already a totalitarian society. And a lot of Latin American um, countries, for instance, look like this. They look like democracies, but they're hollowed out in effect and people right. have given up, right? So people really need to know that because I think they think, well, it's I can still go to Walmart or I can still drive in the country or, you know, it, 
the New York Times is still publishing. Therefore, the coup hasn't happened yet. And right. what I'm saying in this book, and I've been saying it for a while, is the coup has happened. You know, it's it's up to us now to, to fight back and get our country back. Um, I guess the post-truth society, I mean, part of the lies around um, the injection, you know, I go into detail about this in, in uh, Facing the Beast, they have a legal reason because um, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Walensky uh, are guilty of mass murder. Albert Borla is guilty of mass murder. I don't say that lightly. Obviously, they need to be tried by a jury of their peers, but the evidence my team of volunteers has found that has been published not just in 90 reports on Daily Clout and in a book on Amazon, but also now in a peer-reviewed journal, um, shows that, for instance, Pfizer knew and the White House knew that they were going to injure the hearts of minors, and they covered that up and went ahead. Um, Pfizer knew that 1,225 people had died in three months, and they covered that and went ahead. They knew that half the deaths and serious adverse events in three different organ categories took place 48 hours after the injection. They covered that up and went ahead. Uh, I mean, the, the examples in Facing the Beast are so shocking. Um, Pfizer gave a report about pregnancy and lactation to the White House in, October, in April of 2021, showing that babies were dying in utero due to, quote, maternal exposure to the vaccine, that breast milk was being contaminated, that babies were going to seizures, fever, edema. As a result of this, they gave this report to Dr. Walensky. Three days later, she issued a White House press conference saying, there's no bad time to have an injection before your pregnancy, during your own pregnancy, after your pregnancy. So we're so let me, at- let me, let me, uh, let, me just inter- let me just interrupt you there. So uh, you, you may not have an answer to this, but how can a doctor like that, and I think there's an additional factor because she's a woman, I don't know if she's a mother or not, but she may be. Uh, how can she, with any sort of conscience, come out and say that? How can she step up and say, yeah, no sweat, go for it, no worries, when she knows it isn't true? Right. I mean, you're asking the essential question, and and that's the question that's at the heart of facing the beast, right? Nothing is working the way that we used to believe it's supposed to work, right? Hospitals that are, and I address this in my chapter called um, Have the Ancient Gods Returned? The Even if you don't actively believe in a Judeo-Christian God, what we have to realize is that the shape of our society still holds the Judeo-Christian ethic shape. In other words, when you um, go to a hospital, you expect your loved one to be healed as much as possible rather than murdered. Or when you, um, you know, when you take a, a child to, to nursery school, you don't expect the child to be trafficked or abused, right? And your question is from the old world, right? The, the Judeo-Christian world, how right. can a mother, how can a, a, someone with a medical background know that this injection was going to kill babies and, and make babies sick and send them into convulsions and, and advocate for it anyway. So that's why I finally kind of grabbed at the metaphysical because not, there is no way you can explain so many hospitals, so many doctors um, embracing euthanasia, essentially, um, or murder. I mean, that's what we're looking at. I just... Our, our team most recently found that their latest bombshell is that Pfizer delayed reporting deaths in the vaccinated group so that they could get the EUA. And if they had reported the deaths, you would have seen an equal number of dead people in the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated group. They hid deaths. Right. They hid two people who died after receiving the injection. This is not, this is like demonic. It's not none of these institutions. You know, you expect the New York Times to be upset when it tells a lie or makes a mistake. I've been in email threads with the New York Times corrections editor with experts showing from primary source documentation that they're wrong and they won't correct the falsehood, right? So- And that, and, and, and what you're saying, that is, that is the beast, right? That's the beast. That is the essence of what the beast is that you're facing. Um, 
you know, this, uh, the ancient gods returned was a very interesting chapter because I think you, you attempted to say, look, the enormity of the evil here that we're talking about, and you, you talked about both the uh, Jewish tradition and the Christian tradition of Satan or an evil spirit or force, and uh, there's differences in how they're described and portrayed. There's the accuser versus this uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, this figure that's a fallen angel that is, uh, you know, he takes Jesus up to the mountaintop and says, worship me and I'll give you all these lands. And he's, so there, there's different in sort of interpretations or views. But you go to and cite, and I find this very interesting, uh, a Messianic Jewish pastor by the name of Jonathan Kahn. And he's talking about, hey, wait a minute, maybe we've opened the door to other evil or to more and different evil forces because the scope of what you're talking about, what you're describing, that involves quote-unquote public health, whatever that means, hospitals, met, uh, doctors, the entire pharmaceutical industry, governments, the, the scope of this evil is so enormous, maybe something else is happening or has been tapped into that we don't normally think about. Maybe you could explain a little bit of that. Yeah, I'll do my best. Um, although kind of by definition in that chapter, I'm trying to name something that we don't really have words for. Right. But basically in that chapter, I'm trying to kind of describe, like in an earlier chapter, I'd come to the conclusion that there was metaph metaphysical evil that had been unleashed in 2020 and you could feel it, you know, like the world, I don't know about you, but the world really felt creepier. <laughs> you know, I agree, after... 100%, 100%. Um, and when I was struggling to think, what is this? I kind of explored the notion of Satan and went back to, you know, Jewish and Christian theology around Satan. And you're right that they're somewhat different in Judaism and Christianity. Hasatan is more of a kind of accuser, more of a lawyer in um, Job and other places in the Hebrew right. Bible, as opposed to this very um, kind of central character opposed to God and, G and tempting Jesus in the New Testament. And then a lot of the way we think about Satan, and I'm a literature uh, defil, so I'm informed by that, in the West has to do with, you know, Dante and Milton and and the Catholic Church and, and art and architecture. There was right. a 400 year elaboration of Satan as a fallen angel and Lucifer. And that's cool and important because we need some way to talk about evil. But to me, it was not sufficient to explain what was going on because. And, and again, these are just names of forces. I don't I'm not trying to say I know that there's a being. Sure, called sure. It's just that there's this force, there's this force evil being. entity there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But even Satan as a force wasn't sufficient for me because Satan is still very intimately involved in with God and humanity in an oppositional way. Satan cares about us in a negative way. He wants our souls. He wants to tempt us. He cares about God in a negative way. This felt like Jonathan Kahn's book, um, The Return of the Gods, even though I don't agree with all of it, it resonated with me. And I think it's interesting. He's a Jew who believes in Jesus Christ, because I think that intersection of both of those traditions has some answers, at least for me, about what, what may have happened to us, or at least some preliminary questions. Because his argument is that by letting go of the Judeo-Christian covenant, right, our commitment to the Ten Commandments, for instance. Right. And the sanctification, I mean, he points out, and it's true, the West has been sanctified to the Judeo-Christian tradition, to the Christian God, you know, the West, like Santa Monica, San Michelle, San Diego, like it's literally been named for Christian holy people. It's been consecrated. A city on a hill, the Puritans, it's a religious foundation, consecrating America, certainly, to God, right? And, li and, and literally, George Washington's first act as president in New York was the consecration of the country to God. I did not know that. That's yeah, funny. that was his first official act upon being sworn in in New York. Wow. So, I mean, it, it is, it's not a, 
a theory uh -huh. or a concept or something like, you know. Uh, Not a conspiracy theory. <laughs> no, it, it, it is, it, this is, these are recorded historical facts, right? So, uh, so it's completely consistent with what you're saying. So his, his thesis is that by letting go of the covenant, we've kind of left the door open to right. ancient forces that have been kind of held at bay for 4,000 years by monotheism under Judaism and then by Jesus, you know, being embraced under Christianity and, and by the Judeo-Christian covenant. So that kind of felt right. And he spells out um, Asherah, which is kind of licentiousness, the fertility goddess, the sacred prostitutes, it's the spirit of like, uh, like the attack on the family, the, you know, kind of completely irresponsible, exploitive sexuality, um, that, that certainly the grooming of children, you see it everywhere, you know, but he also identifies Baal, who, uh, who was, um, you know, absorbed children and Malach, I mean, child child sacrifice was given to Baal, and Malach, who's just the spirit, it seemed root as Amalekites, kind of wickedness, the spirit of just sheer gross power and, and greed. And so to me, those names, even though, again, I'm not being literal, felt more aligned with what I feel around me, which is um, forces who don't care about human, human beings, who don't like the family, who, um, I mean, look what lockdowns targeted everything that God made that's good, you know, targeted churches and synagogues and mosques, targeted schooling, singing, um, community, targeted friends eating together, targeted culture, um, all the things that make us civilized, that distinguish us from animals. And so now there's this inrushing, remaking our institutions that doesn't care about truth, I'll say the media, right? Doesn't care about babies, doesn't care. I've seen these bills, they're real in Washington State, Maryland, that decriminalize letting a baby die of neglect a month after it's born, if you haven't yep. already. I've, I'm you know, kind of nominally pro-choice in the first trimester, just out of desperation, thinking of an alternative, but but these bills that, you know, this push to say abortion is a sacrament, you know, kill the baby in the second trimester, kill the baby in the third trimester. This is not, like, this isn't even necessary, right? This is some sort of Baalite, Malachite. Yeah, no, I mean, you're, you're, you're describing it, you're describing it exactly correctly. And it takes itself in the form of the New York State Assembly applauding when they approved a, a bill for abortion right up until birth. The whole place stood up and cheered. They thought it was fabulous. You had Governor Northam in Virginia, who's a pediatric neurosurgeon, describing how after you deliver the child, then you can make a decision whether you let it die or not. No, he, he did it that? live. He did it live on a radio show. Holy. Uh, yeah. And this is again, the governor was a pediatric neurosurgeon. He knows better. And he says, yeah, you can deliver the child, and then you can decide whether you let it go. I think that that was the word that he. He tried to use some kind of soft language, but it was absolutely brutal and gruesome. And then, you know, in the course of the pandemic, there's decisions that are made. So what's essential, what's non-essential, right. right? So churches, synagogues, you have to close. You can't dare get together. But we're going to make sure that liquor stores and abortion clinics remain open. Totally. I mean, that's the value judgment, right? That, that's the what, what do we need, what don't we need? What do we got to have, what don't we have to have? And that is a level of evil yes. uh, and something that never gets talked about. We've seen suicide, drug and alcohol abuse rates skyrocket throughout the pandemic. And it's just kind of, it's a shrug. Yeah, well, you know, you got to break a few eggs if you want to make an omelet. That's the way it goes. Too bad. But the consequences to society are devastating. It, so... That's the kind of evil that we're talking about. And I think your book in that chapter on ancient gods returned, maybe, we, maybe we've gone so far that we have kicked the door open to something else. And I don't know what it is either. I can't put a finger on it, but you do a great job of at least giving it a, you know, hey, let's pause for a second and look at what we're doing. Let's look at the consequences here. Um, a couple more points I want to go over if I can. One is, uh, you talk about, it, it's discussed in a bookstore portion of your book, but it's, I think it's also a critique of some of your former colleagues 
in the world of journalism, there's really a lack of courage. Authors are silent, with the exception of you and obviously a handful of others, people like Brownstone Institute and others who are writing about this all, your efforts, but really all the people that you would think would point at this, what we've been through and say, whoa, this is a civil rights issue, this is a public health issue, we've completely screwed this up, we turned ourselves inside out over nothing. There's no courage and there's, no, there's silent authors. You could, in fact, you do in your book, you rattle off four or five names and say, so where's their book? Where's their long journal piece on this? And there isn't. Well, exactly. I mean, <laughs> you know, we've talked about the different kinds of harms these last two and a half years have caused. One of them is to the poor, you know, and especially poor children of color who were pushed back academically further than their more privileged peers. So people like, uh, you know, commentators who usually write about the well-being of African-American communities were completely silent on this. I don't know a single book from the left about that harm. You know, people like women were, were kicked out of the workforce because they couldn't manage overseeing distance learning, distance learning children sure. and being at work. Uh, feminists like Susan Faludi, you know, or the National Organization of Women were completely silent on the losses to, to women. Um, you know, people who know about, well, here's, here's one, uh, Naomi Klein, whose name I try not to mention, I haven't read her book, but she's a distinguished, she was a distinguished author on um, crisis capitalism, how it, governments and corporations make money when yep. horrible things happen. Well, the COVID response is the biggest example, most egregious example of crisis capital, disaster capitalism is what she calls exactly. it. Exactly, yep. Ever, and she hasn't bothered to write a book or give an interview or write an article about that. Instead, she's devoted a whole book to basically stalking me and portraying me as a crazy person because I am concerned about it. So all of these people, and you could go on and on, people who, you know, care about women's health, the our bodies, not our bodies ourselves, the, um, well, they've been silent about the harms to women and women are 62% of those injured in the Pfizer documents with 16% of those being reproductive disorders, Pfizer's words. You know, the, the Boston Women's Health Collective, crickets, nothing. Right. Uh, the woman who wrote What to Expect When You're Expecting had a nice chat with Dr. Walensky. And, you know, the person who said, don't eat sushi, don't have a second cup of coffee when you're pregnant is like, sure, inject this. Spike protein. Yeah, that's great for exactly. you. Have at it. Right. It's crazy. Just nuts. Yeah. And, uh, and there's not a lot of... Uh, I'm not going to go into details, but persons that I know, <laughs> there's not a lot of uh, ability to engage with them on this topic. So, you know, they're triple masked and they're doing whatever it is they're doing. And they're not interested in, in you know, any kind of discussion or even examining, you know, obviously Judicial Watch, we get a ton of primary source records and documents. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we put everything we get up on our website. And we have, I mean, just reams and reams of records and documents from FDA, CDC, the whole alphabet soup of HHS organizations, all kinds of material, make it all public. And I, you can show people stuff and if you, it's in their hands in front of them, they don't wanna know. And I, it's, a, it's, it's very difficult to get around that. Um, that's really part of the psychological conditioning that you touched on earlier. Uh, I know in your book you also mentioned Matthias Desmet's book on totalitarian kind of mass psychosis, and I think this is another example of that. Uh, I did note, though, in the last week, in fact, I think I saw it, maybe it was on Monday, uh, but New York Magazine finally came out with an article that said, uh, hey, me, uh, lockdowns were a huge public health experiment and I think we blew it, or words to that effect. So New York Magazine, the first article I've seen, particularly from an outlet like that, I'm a native New Yorker, so I know, uh, you know, for them to make an admission or to say, hey, this lockdown thing, we overdid it. 
to me was astounding. It's sort of a one crack in the ice. I'm not sure how much further it's going to go, but there's one article. So that's big. I mean, I have to credit, you know, the hard work we're doing. We just hammer away. I mean, Judicial Watch and Daily Cloud and War Room and, you know, these alternative media sources were marginalized and marginalized, but we just keep talking and bringing the receipts. And I think that even people in the most benighted, I've got Brooklyn behind me through the, <laughs> the most benighted cities in America, the truth is crossing their feeds from time to time because of our perseverance. So yep. New York Magazine has to address it. That's exciting. However, I'm also cynical because these legacy media outlets are so implicated in medical misinformation and killing people and sterilizing yep. people that I think they're also trying to get ahead of the lawsuits. Very, I mean, in the end, <laughs> that's what they're worried about is the, the, the legal exposure. And uh, I think that's a very good analysis. That that's exactly what they're trying to get ahead of. Uh, hey, listen, as we wrap up here, I want to give you the last word. We've talked about all kinds of stuff. Uh, your book is fantastic, Facing the Beast. You. Um, you have a website, dailyclout.io, which has tons of information up there as well. But uh, before we close, I just want to pause and say, Dr. Naomi Cl uh, Wolf, what, what, of, all the, of all the stuff that we have covered and discussed, what would you like to particularly highlight? I guess I'd just like to end by saying, as horrible <laughs> as are the subjects we've covered and that I cover in Facing the Beast, I think it's also an incredibly hopeful time because we have the opportunity in the collapse of these institutions and you know, in conversations like this, right? And conversations people are having across the country of realizing that we need to rebuild America. We need to kind of redefend the constitution and that maybe our enemies are not on the left right axis, but the servitude freedom axis. Yeah. And that we find new alliances uh, as we commit to you know, making it 1776 again. Our guest has been Dr. Naomi Wolf and her book is Facing the Beast. Actually, it has a subtitle too, Courage, Faith and Resistance in a new dark age. It's a fantastic book. I highly recommend it to you. So all of you out there watching or listening, please be sure to get a copy. It's actually, like you said, as you just closed out saying, it really is very hopeful. There's a lot of scary, crazy stuff in here, but um, your personal journey, I think, kind of carries the story through and makes people reflect on what, what's possible, what's available to us now. It's not just doom and gloom, scary, bad news. There's a good news part of this. And uh, I'm very glad you wrote the book. It's great. Thank you. I'm so glad. Thank you so much. And please give my regards to your colleagues at Judicial Watch. Which I, I sure will. I'm Chris Farrell on Watch.